thanks for coming out today. Um, good crowd. Uh, so I'm uh, going to, uh, I was asked to tell you a little bit uh, about running for uh, public office. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. But I also uh, wanted to give you uh, just an overview of what I did uh, as a fellow. If I can figure out. Yeah, so, uh, so this was this is not the exact ad I answered, uh, but this is the one from 2014. Uh, and uh, I uh, thought that I would like to come to Washington and learn a little more uh, about how uh, the grant funding agencies uh, worked, uh, especially NSF, NIH, and so forth. Uh, it turned out I learned none of that. Uh, <laughs> I became a uh, congressional or a AAAS uh, congressional fellow. Uh, just like most of you, so you saw a photo of your class, uh, for those of you who are sitting out there, this was uh, my class, and just to help uh, find me amongst that, I've drawn this giant blue arrow <laughs> uh, to, to show you where, where I, I'm located. So uh, I got to, uh, this was the prom, so those of you who are uh, congressional fellows uh, <clears throat> know what this is. This is we're in the waiting room there. Uh, and then in a few minutes, a mass of staffers and, and uh, congress members came in and uh, basically were, uh, attacked us and tried to get us to come work in their offices, but uh, that was fun. So I ended up working for uh, uh, Steve Cohen. Steve, is, uh, he's from Memphis, so uh, it was a uh, right next door to where my district is, the first congressional district in Mississippi. Uh, and so I knew a lot about Memphis because it's our closest big city, and so we had a lot to talk about. Um, but the first, uh, <clears throat> the first thing we talked about was entirely college football, uh, and the second thing we talked was entirely uh, Warren Zevon, a musician. So, uh, and so the reason I mentioned that is that's how we hit it off. But uh, if you ever think about running for politics, uh, in addition to science policy and all the education you got, uh, you got to be able to talk about football and music. I think that's a, uh, uh, that's a uh, an important component because you have to have people identify with you. Um, and so uh, my training for years is, uh, is uh, I trained as a biochemist. It's technically a chemist, but I do biochemistry and have been in cancer research for 30 years. But uh, so I walk in and they say, well, what, what did you do? Uh, I'm a biochemist. And they went, bio, bio? You, you've got the healthcare portfolio. <laughs> <clears throat> and as I tried to explain, there's a lot of difference between protein structure and Medicare billing codes. but. <laughs> But they made me do it anyway. So, uh, so anyway, I got to uh, handle the healthcare uh, uh, portfolio, and and, uh, uh, and if you you know you hear on the news all the time about how uh, of a mess the healthcare policy in the United States is, uh, it's true, and I got to see it uh, up close and personal. And and so I just wanted to point out the reason that uh, <coughs> the they were, we were being rushed into that room earlier uh, is because normally uh, these positions of staffers make uh, about 35k a year, and so they get us for free. So that's money they can use for for other things. So that's why the that's why this program, the congr especially the congressional fellow program, uh, is so popular on the Hill uh, because um, uh, it's free labor for them anyway. And so this was the you know, most of the time I was here, the Capitol was was uh, under construction. Those of you, uh, here's your trivia question for the day: What's the Capitol made out of? The the answer is cast iron, and so. If you, if you have cast iron furniture or like I do a skillet and you throw it out in your yard for 50 or 60 years, uh, it doesn't look very good anymore after that time. So, so they were repairing it for the first time in I think 60 years or something like that. So it wasn't as pretty as it is now. So your class is luckier, but, it, but I enjoyed walking by it every day. Uh, and my job, uh, the duties for the congressional fellows, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's just this. You meet with constituents, uh, you, um, you uh, brief the congressman on the issues, you recommend votes, uh, and you represent the congressman at uh, caucus meetings. And a couple of times I organized district meetings, which would be back in uh, Memphis. And um, uh, it's very interesting. The last one I organized was on something called uh, eating healthy in a food <coughs> desert. So uh, many of you may know what that is. A lot of cities, especially urban areas, uh, are food deserts. They don't have grocery stores, right? Uh, I know it's hard to imagine for a lot of us, but it's, it's true. And so we did a panel on that. <clears throat> well, one of the uh, persons who I invited to come all the way from Knoxville, Tennessee, drove over to Memphis 
uh, and uh, uh, she was into sustainable farming in, in urban areas and trying to do that. Uh, anyway, the, the reason I mention her is because uh, last night she won the Democratic primary in the second district of Tennessee. So uh, of that meeting that I organized, and counting the congressmen, now three of us are running for uh, Congress in November. So that was a, that's a bit, uh, bit unusual for, uh, for, I don't know that you'll have that luck if you organize meetings or, or the folks from next year, but uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, and then I sat where you're all sitting. Unfortunately, Rush couldn't be here today, but uh, so I sat and listened to, to Rush talk. Uh, and then that was it. So for a year I was running the government, uh, and on, fr on Friday of the last day I was here, uh, I told the office goodbye. On Saturday I packed up all my bags and went to the airport, flew back to Mississippi. On Sunday I went to my office uh, at, uh, at, the, at the university where I work uh, and, got, and put my syllabi together, and then Monday morning I was teaching again. So it was very abrupt. So for those of you who are fellows, there's something called the fellows crash that happens, and it'll happen. It'll probably happen to you, where you're. It's it's such a phenomenal experience, but then it just abruptly ends, and then you're you're back to doing other things. But by the way, university is very nice. One of the top ten most uh, beautiful you know, campuses usually, and uh, uh, so if you ever get a chance to visit, also our most famous graduate uh, <laughs> will graduate in 240 years or so. Uh, an, uh, unless you count Eli Manning. Okay. Okay, so that, I tell you all that just to give you the background of, uh, <clears throat> of how I decided to, uh, to, to make this jump into politics because uh, I've, never, I've never done this. I've been in science for 30 years like many of you. Uh, that's all I've ever done. Uh, but a lot of things happen. Uh, first, I just finished the, the Congressional uh, Fellowship uh, and during that time, I spent a year watching the person who represents my district vote. Uh, every, you know, every time there was a vote in the House, I got to watch him. I wish most people could do that. I wish you could watch how your representative votes, because it would really change your mind about what you feel about your uh, uh, representative. And in my case, I obviously, maybe obviously, didn't, didn't agree with the way he was voting, right? Um, there were a number of anti-science candidates that got elected in 2016. Uh, that was disturbing. Uh, I came up with a women's march, and I saw the, uh, just the, the, the sheer uh, energy that people uh, wanted to change the way government uh, works in this country. Uh, then in 2017, there were proposed uh, uh, budget cuts to, to all the science funding agencies. And then, uh, then back home, uh, my current representative refuses to meet with his constituents. And so given the fact that I'd just spent a year in Congress and all the other uh, things that were going on, uh, I decided to take the leap and, and, and run uh, for, uh, for Congress. And uh, now, uh, now I'm the Democratic nominee from the 1st Congressional District of Mississippi, and I'll be on the ballot in November. And so everybody keep your... <laughs> Uh, it's still a little weird to drive around and see yard signs with your name on them all over. The <laughs> so I mean, it's just, but that's the way it is. Uh, well, oh yeah, and I forgot. I got ahead of myself. So I was gonna. This is this was our unofficial logo. <laughs> we 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 tested out this logo, and it no, it was not like the. Uh, uh, you know, people were like, oh my God, you want to you want to build nuclear reactors? <laughs> Like, no, no, it's a science thing. But, nah. Anyway, so I was talked out of this, but I kind of liked it. So I figured this crowd would appreciate it a little bit more. Uh, okay, and so, uh, so here are my tips if you decide to ever uh, run for office. So I've been doing this for about a year and a half now, and uh, I've learned a lot. You, like any experience, you learn things. You make mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I've also learned a lot of things. Uh, and so I just want to give you some kind of tips and anecdotes uh, about what I've seen so far that to prepare yourself should you ever foolishly decide to run for office. No, no, I'll come back to that. Uh, I don't know if this movie is gonna play. Well, 
it's okay. It, it doesn't have to play. It was, uh, I had a little clip from Hellboy, uh, and, it, and it talks about, uh, there's a scene uh, where uh, one of the characters says, there are things that go bump in the night and we bump back. And that's what I, I sort of was always my campaign uh, idea was that uh, there was so much going wrong uh, with the country that uh, somebody's got to bump back and somebody's got to do something back. So uh, if you feel that way uh, and you want to get involved with politics, uh, there's a certain number of things that you should think about. First, uh, are you in good physical and psychological health? Because uh, it's exhausting, it's absolutely exhausting. Uh, both from a, a mental and physical point of, uh, of view. And I don't mean to whine, you know, it's what I asked for, so be careful what you ask for, but uh, it does take a toll on you, uh, and so you have to be prepared, uh, you have to be prepared for that. But anyway, I was excited uh, when we first got started, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and apparently a lot of people were. So uh, the Washington Post, uh, for example, said, uh, wow, 2018 is going to be the year that, of scientists running for Congress, right? So there was this great, uh, great deal of uh, enthusiasm uh, at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, and then kind of reality begins to set in. So uh, first of all, you realize when you're running, you're running usually against someone else. And those someone else's have allies. And so those allies can be, can do some un unpleasant things. So. This letter, as you can see, it's dated May 2nd of 2017. That was just shortly after I declared uh, my candidacy and filed the paperwork uh, with the Federal Election Commission. Uh, we got this, um, the university got this letter uh, from uh, a, basically a uh, lobbying organization or a think tank uh, based out of Virginia. And as you can see, uh, they wanted everything about me. They wanted all, because I work at a public university, they wanted to know uh, everything about me, my salary, and if I'd ever been reprimanded and all that, uh, that stuff. Uh, and apparently this is fairly straightforward. So a colleague who was uh, going to run at the University of North Alabama, they received this letter and he immediately dropped out of the race, right? So this is because you, you don't know uh, where that's gonna go. Uh, but I didn't feel so bad because I have, you know, we all have skeletons in the closet, but mine, you know, fairly intact, decent skeletons in there. <laughs> I, I grew up before everybody had cell phones with cameras on them, you know, so, <laughs> so, so that's, you know, everything you've ever done in your life is now on the internet, but in, when I grew up, that wasn't necessarily so. Uh, and, and so, again, there was this sense of enthusiasm, though, so it kept me going. And this was the Los Angeles Times called, and they were excited. And they actually got my name uh, through a, a AAAS fellow, who I don't know if is here today. Uh, but you know, they decided to um, track the, the races for, for five uh, candidates uh, who were running for federal office. Uh, and that didn't last very long, because uh, a lot of those got uh, beat in the early primaries. Okay, so, so three of the five of us uh, are out. Uh, Patricia Zornio is considering a Senate run. <clears throat> Excuse me, so she's not actually up until 2020, so she has two more years to, to see what happens there. Uh, and then it got even worse. So this is the, the, the previous one, the people got knocked out in the early primary, so some states, uh, they start very early, like uh, April. Uh, and then, then there's Super Tuesday, uh, and all the scientists took a walloping. There's just almost, almost everybody that was running that we all thought was gonna be the year of the scientists. Well, it was the year of scientists running for Congress. Getting elected to Congress is the harder part. Uh, and so a lot of folks didn't make it through the primaries. Uh, uh, and so there's only a handful of us, a uh, handful of us left. Uh, so my second tip to you uh, is accept that you might lose. Uh, and I like to think of this, I write a lot of grant proposals, so uh, I, know what it's, I know what it's like to work really hard on something and have absolutely nothing come of it, right? And so, uh, and so that's part of this same thing, is, is you, you have to think going in, what if I lose? Can I handle that? And some people, you know, that's a terrifying thought, right? But, but it's part of it. So you have to, you have to be prepared to lose. Uh, and I think uh, 
The other thing is that you need a sense uh, of the place that where you're running. So I've seen and heard various folks uh, who uh, move somewhere and decide to run for office. Uh, and, and that's tough, I mean, it's tough uh, because you don't have the connection. Uh, so we, as scientists, we're already seen by the voting public as being you know, kind of eggheads and their ivory towers and all, all that stuff. Uh, and so we don't, uh, uh, you know, we're already looked at you know, with, with slant eye. And so you have to have uh, some kind of sense of the place uh, where you live and some connection to that. Uh, and so um, here, here's my uh, example. Anybody know what those are? Right, they're purple hole peas, right? They're purple hole peas. And so, so I, I always tell the story uh, to kind of, when I meet people for the first time, well, I've told it a zillion times, but uh, anecdotally, I, I saw John Lewis when I was in Congress, I saw him three times, he gave exactly the same speech, three times, word for word. I thought I could almost give it the fourth time after I heard it. So, so you say these things over and over, but because most people in the room, there might be people who haven't heard it before. But anyway, this is, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in a really rural area in Mississippi, uh, we were borderline uh, in poverty. My parents had grown up in, in real poverty. So my dad uh, didn't have running water and electricity in his house until he was, he was uh, in his uh, early uh, teens. Uh, and so he had to go, you know, get a bucket of water and bring it back to the house, you know, to cook and clean. Uh, they, they had an outhouse, you know, like you see, it was it's literally something like if you, if you're ever like up late at night and one of those Beverly Hillbillies reruns comes on, it was sort of like that, you know, they're the, that was the kind of family that I grew up in. Uh, and my mom had grown up also very poor and, uh, and they used education to get, to get out of poverty, right? My, my mom uh, went to school and got her uh, teaching degree and became an elementary school teacher. Uh, and my dad uh, got a, went to a college and got a certificate uh, to be a uh, registered sanitarian. So he worked uh, for the health department, right? The state health department. So that's about as blue collar as it gets. So your mom's an elementary school teacher and your dad works for the health department, right? And, but uh, they had come you know, out of poverty, both of them, and their families before them had all come out of poverty. And so that never left their minds. So on Saturday mornings, I used to hate Saturday mornings uh, because uh, while all the other kids were watching cartoons, I had to, my parents would get me up at the crack of dawn and take me to the garden, right, the family garden. We didn't have a very big one. And they would pick all kinds of things, but I was a kid and I used to pick my, my weight in purple hole peas every Saturday morning, right? And then we would, we would come back and, and, and can all that stuff and put it in the pantry because they were, they were, never, they were raised in an era where they were not always sure where the next meal was coming from and where uh, when, you know, we might be back back to that situation. They were also uh, concerned about getting sick because if you got sick, you missed a day at work. If you missed, missed a day at work, you didn't get paid. And, and if you didn't get paid, you might not eat. And so from a very early age, uh, I was able to put together this understanding that, that providing for your family, getting a job, education, and healthcare are all related, interrelated things, right? They're all interrelated. And so when politicians try to talk about these things separately, it's almost impossible to separate those things out. Uh, and so when you try to fix one of those things, uh, you can't really do it without fixing the other things that go along with it. So I tell that story because that <coughs> resonates uh, with the, my district is very rural, as you might imagine, excuse me. And so the, that really resonates because my family wasn't the only one that grew up like this. Lots of families did. And they, they always remember this story. Uh, and so if you're thinking about running whatever you're doing, you have to ask, how does, how does your personal narrative fit into the context of the, um, of the place where you're running? Okay, then that's your kind of personal narrative and your sense of place that you, you wanna have. Uh, but you also need a compelling story, especially about what you're gonna do if you get elected, or why you should get elected if you wanna uh, do that. So uh, this is one I use on occasion, depending on the audience, but uh, we're scientists here today, <clears throat> so I'm gonna tell this one. Um, I don't know if anyone knows who that uh, gentleman on the screen is. What's that? McNair. Ronald McNair, Ronald McNair. 
So Ronald McNair uh, grew up uh, during segregation in Lake City, South Carolina. Uh, and during that era, again, while segregation was still going on, uh, he famously somehow found himself uh, in a library, in a public library. Uh, and he wanted to check out some books to take home to read. Well, they wouldn't let him because it was a segregated library. Well, he refused to leave until he could check out these library books. So, you know, you got an all-white staff, a young black kid in a library. What do you do? You call the police, of course. You know, things haven't changed a whole lot. So they called the police, and they finally they got his mother down to the library, and, uh, and they worked, worked it out so that he could take those books home to read and then bring them back later. Well, he went on to uh, MIT, and he got a degree in physics, and he became the second African-American uh, in space. And uh, many people in this room watched uh, Ronald McNair die uh, because he was on board the Challenger shuttle when it exploded, right? But that's not the, the end of the Ronald McNair story. Um, the U.S. Department of Education <clears throat> wanted to create a program uh, to encourage minority students to go into the sciences. And so they created the Ronald E. McNair uh, program uh, just for that. And so there was a, we have a, a chapter of that at the university where I'm at. And uh, the, uh, we, I had a student who was going to a little small HBCU called uh, Tougaloo College down in Jackson. Uh, and she, so she came to my lab and worked one summer on a research project. Uh, and I helped her out a little bit with that. And then she went back to her university. Uh, and then she went on to make history. Uh, she became the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Alabama with a PhD in chemistry, right? And so I use this story to explain that those of us who understand the power of what science, uh, education, and diversity bring to the table can change a lot of lives, not just one life and not just the, uh, one, you know, one person, but the entire world. Uh, and I think that's something that I bring to Congress that we sorely need there. So I tell that story because I think it illustrates you know, how my background ties into what I want to do when I get to Congress, right? Oh, by the way, that um, library in South Carolina is now the Ronald McNair Library. <laughs> so, so there's a happy ending to it all. Um, so the, another uh, thing you're going to need is money, right? <laughs> yeah, you're going to need money. This came out uh, about a week or so ago, right? Uh, and it sounds good, you know, but, uh, but the reality is the, uh, we've only raised about $130,000, uh, and the average house race uh, is about $4 million. So we're a little cheaper. It's a cheaper market, so we don't, we're not going to raise $4 million. We'd be lucky if we raise $1 million. But, but that's the kind of money you need. And whatever race that you're running, so a Senate race is 10 times that, right? So whatever race you're running or thinking about running, the first thing you ought to ask yourself is, can you finance that? Uh, because there's a lot of mouths to feed, and you have to do a lot of things, right? You have to travel a lot, um, and you have to uh, try to, you know, get, get uh, your name in the newspaper, working with reporters. There's all kinds of things that you have to do. But the financing part is one of the hardest. And where scientists really struggle uh, is because most of us have a small network compared to many other occupations, right? I mean, uh, if you're a lawyer, you know, you go to these lawyer conventions, uh, legal conventions, and there's, you know, they're gigantic, right? But for those of us in science, especially the more basic science you get, the more problematic it gets because your, your network gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And most of us are blue collar workers, right? We don't make a whole lot of money. And so I would love to, and I'm not independently wealthy, you know, and so you've got to come up with that money somehow. And that's a constant ongoing uh, issue. So, a warning about the money. Okay, and the final, <laughs> the final thing I want to say is you should run for office. Don't let anything that I've just said dissuade you from running for office. Because you might win. You might, you might reach the moon, right? And uh, to paraphrase John F. Kennedy, 
Uh, we do these things not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And so it's very hard, but you should do it. And uh, I think the last thing I had was another movie. I don't think it's going to play, but it doesn't matter. It's from uh, uh, Pacific Rim. And, and, <laughs> and anyway, the point is that at one point, when it looks like all hope has failed, uh, Idris Elba says, today we're canceling the apocalypse. <laughs> and so uh, that's my task to all of you who decided to go run, go cancel the apocalypse. Uh, thanks for, to the AAAS for having me today. <coughs> uh, thank you, fellows, for everything you've done, uh, and go change the world. Thanks. <laughs>